All right, so the recording is on. Let's just uh, pray together, and then we will get started in our course, um, BC 308 on Revelation and Daniel. And uh, let's just pray and ask God that uh, as we look into his word, um, we will receive understanding and also revelation, and our lives will be strengthened. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please, um, as, as we begin? Father God, we come before you, throne once again. Mm -hmm. We want to just say thanking you, Father God, to everything. Thanking you, Father God, to you, uh, your word, Father God. Thanking you, the subject. Thanking you, to every, everyone, Father God. Give your wisdom and knowledge and mm -hmm. peace and comfort, Father God. Give your revelation, Father God, that we can understand the subject, Father God. Thanking you. Submitting to your hand every time, Father. Thanking you. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. We are going through our study um, in the book of Revelation. And um, just quickly review a few things. We are still in the early chapters of um, Revelation. Just to quickly review um, our approach to the book of, uh, our, our approach in studying the book of Revelation is that uh, one of the things we've said is that really um, uh, the Lord Jesus gave the soul revelation to John the Apostle, um, you know, in, in three parts. He said, um, write the things you have seen, the things that are, and the things that are yet to come. So we have broken or let's say we have divided the book of revelation into those three timelines things that you have seen are essentially what john saw right then that is revelation chapter one things that are which has to do with the seven churches that existed at that time when john was there which is revelations chapter two and three and then things which are to come that means things that are going to happen in the future which is revelation chapter 4 on till the end so we divide uh, or yeah we, we break up the book of revelation to three three simple things just as the lord told john uh, we are right now uh, going through chapters 2 and 3 uh, just looking at those seven churches um uh, what was happening with those seven churches and um, what lessons we can learn from those seven churches. So we are just going through that. I'll quickly summarize some things and then we just, uh, we are in chapter three. So we will finish that and then move on into chapter four. So, um, you know, as the Lord Jesus uh, is revealing this to John and, you know, John sees that the Lord holds the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars, each of the star represents the, um, the leader of each of the seven churches, the human leader of the seven churches. So he holds the seven stars in his right hand. And um, uh, the Lord is also the one who walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. So each of the seven churches is represented by a lampstand. And the Lord is walking in the midst. That means he is, you know, overseeing, uh, looking at all those seven churches. Now, what we mentioned last week is um, this is only representative of uh, uh, what God is, what the Lord is doing. That means uh, the reality is there were hundreds of churches at that time all across, you know, uh, the Middle East and across the Mediterranean. Uh, literally hundreds of churches, you know, small, small, small towns, villages, cities. Uh, so there were many, many churches. Uh, but the, in the vision, the message that is coming across to us is the Lord is holding the leaders of the churches in his hand, both as a protection and also as a, a sign of accountability. That means these leaders are accountable to the Lord. They're answerable to the Lord. And secondly, 
the Lord is the one who walks in the midst of the churches, meaning he is overseeing. He is looking into every local church, how it's working, how what is happening, what is going on. He is seeing. You know, so it's it's uh, even though here we are seeing only you know seven church, seven stars, seven churches, seven lampstands. The reality is, this applies to all uh, of of the churches of the Lord, right? So that's something we mentioned, and therefore it applies to us as well. You know, we are here two thousand years later, but the message the Lord gives to each of these churches is a message uh, for us today. That means we must also check our own lives as leaders and also our own churches uh, as leaders because the Lord is looking into every local church, examining it, seeing how it's doing, etc. Right? So just to cover the churches we uh, have gone through, uh, Revelation 2, we, the first church that the Lord speaks is the church 2, is the church in Ephesus. And uh, quickly summarizing, you know, he says that, you know, he knows this church is a very good church. Uh, they're doing the ministry, they're doing the work, and they're very diligent. They are very, you know, they are very discerning and so on. But yet the one thing he, he says is, look, you have departed from your first love. And so you need to repent and you need to do the first works. So first love, first works are very important and they have to be maintained first in our lives. First love for the Lord, first works towards the Lord that has to always to be maintained. And if we depart from that, uh, the Lord Jesus is telling the church in Ephesians, you have actually fallen. That means uh, you have gone down. You know, you're not, you're not where you're supposed to be. Why? Simply because they have gone away from their first love. They have stopped doing the first works. So we learn from that, you know, how important it is to keep our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. And to do the first works, which is to seek him first to pray, to read the Bible, uh, to, you know, just focus on him in worship. Those are the first works, meaning that the, the works that express my first love, those are first works. So I must do that first, keep that always in, in our lives, and then, okay, go about all the other things. It's a good things. So the challenge for you and me is personally as leaders, we must maintain first love and first works and also make sure the congregation, the church as a whole, maintains first love and first works. That means keep the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and um, don't let um, the ministry, the works, you know, they were doing a lot of work and they were, the church in Ephesians were very uh, strong, etc. But you shouldn't let that become more important than first love, first works. The church in Smyrna, uh, the Lord uh, recognizes that, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they're, they're doing their works, they're doing the ministry, uh, they're going through hardship. Uh, uh, they, may, they may not be very well off. So he says, I know your poverty. Uh, you know, they must have been struggling financially in the natural, etc. But he still tells them, you are rich. I mean, spiritually, they're really good. So, so the church is, is a good church. It's one, of, it's one of the two churches that he doesn't rebuke. He doesn't tell them they have to repent of anything. He only warns them that uh, they're going to face hardship for 10 days, uh, but he's going to let them be tested. So the reason why he doesn't stop the hardship is it's part of their testing. That is, they're, they're going to, you know, be tested, they're going to come out fine. They're going to come out stronger. So he, you know, he's letting them go through those hardships. Um, and, you know, he just says, you endure, um, you overcome, and um, you be faithful unto death. The church in Pergamos and the church in Thyatira, which we saw last week, uh, both these churches 
had kind of a similar problem. The problem was they were taller. I mean, they were good churches. Uh, again, they had, you know, they were doing their works. They were walking in love. Uh, so, like he tells the entire and I, verse 19 of Revelation 2, I, I know your love, your works, your love, your service, your faith, your endurance. Uh, so, you know, he's really commending this church. They're doing very well. But the common problem in both these churches was they were tolerating wrong doctrine. They were tolerating it. So in the church in Pergamos, uh, they were tolerating the wrong doctrine of uh, Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Basically, this, this doctrine was leading people to do things that are displeasing to the Lord. So how do we test doctrine? What is the fruit of that doctrine? You know, uh, how is it affecting people's lives? Is it drawing them closer to the Lord? It is, is it helping them become more like Jesus? Or is it causing them to go into things that are wrong, sinful, displeasing to God? So in the case of the church in Pergamos, uh, the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of Nicolaitans was just leading people away. In the case of the church in Thyatira, they were tolerating a woman who claimed to be a prophetess. But what she was doing was actually leading people, or her teaching, what she was teaching, was actually leading people into sin, doing things that are displeasing to God. So once again, the Lord is not happy about that. So the learning for us here is, we have to watch over um, the doctrine, what we allow to be preached and taught and uh, brought to the people in our care, right? We have to make sure that uh, uh, what we preach or what is taught, what is brought to the people should strengthen them and help them become more like Christ uh, and not, you know, give them a license to go do things that are wrong, um, things that are displeasing to God. That's that's a test. We have to be watchful. And so, in both these churches, he says you need to repent. You need to get it back. Get you know, get back. You know, take these things out. He says, I hate it. I hate this kind of teaching. I hate this thing. To get it out, stay focused. So it's a learning for us. Then we went into chapter 3, the church in Sardis. Uh, we kind of uh, did that very, very quickly. Um, um, the church in Sardis had a different kind of a problem, but it is something we also must be very careful about. The problem with the church in Sardis was they had a reputation, a name that they were alive. But the Lord said to them, you are dead. So we cannot go by reputation. We cannot go by what people say about us. As leaders especially, we have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, what are you saying about the church that I am pastoring, I'm leading? Where are we? You know, how do you see us in, in the sense, uh, is everything okay? Are there things we need to correct? Because if you only go by reputation, which is what people are saying about us, you know, like the church in Sardis, they may say, wow, what a, you know, a wonderful church. Uh, what, a, you know, this church is alive. This church is full of life. And they may say nice things, but we can't go by that. So that was a problem with this church in Sardis. People were saying, you're alive, but the Lord was saying, you are dead. And then he points out certain things. He says, your works are not perfect before me, before God. That means, you know, they were doing things, but what they were doing was not right in God's eyes. I mean, it, you know, 
it wasn't what really what God wanted them to do. And then he also points out, he says, you know, this is in verse three, uh, remember, remember how you have received and heard, hold fast. So it seems like they had left the things that they were taught in the very beginning and they got moved away from it. So he says, remember how you received and heard, you know, what you were taught in the very beginning. Remember those things and hold fast to it. So it teaches us how important it is for as a church, as a church, that we need to hold on to the foundational, fundamental truths and not depart from it. Hold on. Remember how you have received and heard and hold fast. Another thing he points out to the church in Sardis is that most of the people there have defiled their garments. That's a phrase that simply means they are now living uh, compromised lives. They're living in, you know, worldly things. So they've defiled their garments, they become worldly. Only there are, or there are only a few of them who have not defiled their garments. That's in Revelation 3 verse 4. So that's another problem we find. So maybe it's, uh, you know, it's because of these things that their works are not right in the eyes of God. And ultimately, they have a reputation, they are alive, but they are dead. So it's a big learning for us. We have to be very careful uh, as leaders and as a church. Say, God, please help us to be right in your eyes. Please help us to live holy uh, before you. Please help us to do the things you want us to do and not worry about reputation. Okay, it's nice if people you know, say nice things about us. Uh, that's up to them, uh, but we can't live by it. We have to go before God and say, what do you say about us? Okay, so we stopped there and uh, we are going to pick up Revelation 3 verse 7. Uh, we're going to look at um, the church in Philadelphia. Okay, so let's please start reading from Revelation chapter 3. Sorry, that was a long review. <laughs> I just reviewed every, you know, the things we uh, did last week, but uh, it took quite a lot of time. Anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 7 to 13. Uh, could somebody read that passage for us? This is the church in Philadelphia. Anyone can read? Siddharth, you want to read that for us, please? Chapter 3 also. Yes, Revelation 3, 7 to 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? This is the work of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of holy. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are who are of the synagogue of Satan. To claim to be Jews who they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial is going to come and the whole world to test inhabitants of the earth. I'm coming soon, hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your power. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they lose it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them the new name. Whoever has been looking for it, what the state says to the Okay, thank you. All right. So um, the Lord is speaking to this church in Philadelphia. Now, this church in Philadelphia is uh, the other church to which the Lord does not rebuke. Uh, he doesn't tell them, you know, repent of anything. 
so church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. These are the two churches. There is no call to repentance. There's no rebuke. But uh, let's look at the church and uh, uh, let's see what the Lord is speaking to them. Right? He is saying, uh, uh, he introduces himself. Again, this is another thing to see uh, across the seven churches, how the Lord introduces himself to each one of the seven churches and what he promises as a reward for the overcomer because these are still, you know, uh, that's who he is today. And so it's very much something we should look into. So he introduces himself as the one who has the key of David. That means he has the authority of the kingdom. The authority of the kingdom, right? David represents King David. He has a key of David, authority of that kingdom. He's just showing to them that uh, he is ruler. He is the one with authority of the line of David. And he says, look, this is verse 7. He says, when I open, no one can shut it. When I shut, no one can open. In other words, this is absolute authority. So he's assuring the church, look, I am the Lord who has absolute authority. I am the one who has the key of David. The king, the ruler of the kingdom, absolute authority. No one can undo what I do. If I open, it remains open. If I shut, it remains shut. And from that introduction, he tells them, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Now, in what exact context this applies, we don't know. Right? Maybe, is it an open door for ministry? Uh, is it an open door in their city to you know, keep growing and reaching people? Uh, what exactly this open door has to do with, of course, the leader of the church and the church would understand um, because, uh, you know, it is, of course, relevant to relevant to their, uh, to what's going on in, in and amongst them. But for us today, we have to remember that the Lord deals with us in a similar way, that the Lord, our Lord, is the one with absolute authority. And when he opens a door for us, nobody can shut it. He says, I've set before you an open door. No one can shut. So when God sets before you or before your church, your ministry, an open door that he's, he's giving you access to do something, he's giving you access to go somewhere, to, you know, to maybe in your city, in your nation, in your region, whatever. If the Lord is doing that in and for you, you just have to walk confidently knowing no one can shut it. No one can stop you. If God is opening the door for you, who can stop it? Right? So that's the assurance he's giving this church. That's a beautiful assurance. I was praying, Lord, you know, let that happen for us as well. You know, just like what you did for this church. Do it for us because God is no respecter of persons. And, uh, you know, of course, our context is different. Uh, we are in a different city and uh, doing a different kind of ministry, uh, ministry here. But he's the same Lord. And he's the same Lord over each of our churches. And then he says, you know, uh, um, if you look at the good side of the church in Philadelphia. And I will just highlight that. Here is a church that has kept his word. You don't find that mentioned in any of the other churches. He says, you have kept my word. So this is in verse 8. So it seems to us that this church in Philadelphia was a church that was committed and was living by <clears throat> and was walking by the word of God. You have kept my word. So through all kinds of things, they've kept his word. They've not denied his name. And um, he also says in verse 10, once again, you have kept my command to persevere. That means you haven't quit. You've kept my command to persevere. They've kept going. 
So these are two things the Lord, you know, highlights about the church. You've kept my word and you've not denied my name. You have kept my command to persevere. Verse 10. Right? So this church seemed to be a church that really stayed with the word of God. Refused to deny Christ in any way. And they persevered. They persevered. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. They kept going. And it is so amazing that what he promises them. First, he had promised them. I said before you, an open door, nobody can shut it. Second, he said, I will make the synagogue of Satan. I will make those people come and worship at your feet so that they will know I love you. The synagogue of Satan represents these Jewish people who were opposing them. They were actually, you know, these people who, or at least they claimed to be Jews, and um, uh, but they were opposing the church. And they were actually, Jesus refers to them as the synagogue of Satan, people who are, you know, the devil is in their midst. They're an assembly or a gathering of uh, Satan's people. What a promise he gives them. He says, I will make them come and worship at your feet. I was praying, Lord, do this for us. You know, those who try to oppose the church, who oppose the work of God, let them come and, you know, bow before the Lord, who is in our midst, and let them acknowledge the Lord loves us, just like what he told this church. And the third thing he promises them is, I will keep you from the hour of tribulation that comes upon the whole, all those who dwell on the earth. And uh, this could, this could refer to the great tribulation coming. It could refer to that. Uh, and some may want to take it in an immediate context, which means something that happened right then and there, in their day and time, which um, the only issue is, uh, he says it's something that will dwell, uh, that comes upon the people, now, on the whole world and those who dwell on the whole earth. So uh, that's the problem. If you apply verse 10 in an immediate context, that means if you put it back in, you know, the first century, well, uh, what kind of a tribulation effect to the whole world? We don't have any. So that is why Revelation 3.10, most likely, and I'm just saying most likely because I'm not saying very definitely, but just we're trying to, understand it most likely points to that great tribulation the trial that will come upon the whole world upon all the people who dwell on the earth he says i'll keep you from it meaning i'll keep you from that great tribulation and he also promises them uh, other things he says you know i will make you a pillar in the temple of my god and uh, write your name and i'll give you a new name and this is what meaning i'm going to uh, uh, what does it mean for a new name? It's a very, uh, it's like, uh, you know, God is getting very personal and he's saying, I'm going to call you by a very special name. Right? That's a Revelation 3.12. It's a name nobody else knows, but he says, you know, I will uh, give you that special name. You know, it's like uh, just between the Lord and you, right? So the Lord and the believer who is the overcomer, I'll give you a special name to show that I love you. And you're going to be part of that new Jerusalem, um, which will come from heaven. So that's all future. It's all in the future. This is the blessing that he has promised believers. Okay. So the key takeaway from the church here in uh, Philadelphia is they kept his word. They didn't deny his name and they kept his command to persevere. And that was it. In response to that, he has promised them wonderful things, something that we can ask for our own congregations in our own churches. God, you said before us an open door, no one can shut. You make those who are opposers come and bow at our feet and let them acknowledge that you love us, Lord. And uh, God, uh, you keep us, preserve us. 
of course, you'll keep us and preserve us from the hour of trial. Okay. So the last church this is this uh, Revelation 3, uh, 14 to or 22. Uh, this is the last one. The church at Laodicea. Um, can somebody read that? Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 22, please. And to the angel of the church of the Laodicea, write, this thing says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were hot. So, so then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may be, may be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes, eyes lit, that you may see as many as I as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be jealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also become overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear, what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm, thank you. Thank you. So, to this church in Laodicea, it is a very, very strong rebuke. Very strong rebuke. Uh, but there is a lot that we can learn and uh, take for ourselves. Now, it is interesting how Jesus introduces himself to this church. He says, look, uh, this is verse 14. He is the Amen, meaning the fulfillment uh, of all the promises of God. He is the Amen. He is the faithful and true witness. He is the one who came into the earth, faithful and true witness, referring to his earthly life. The one who lived on this earth and bore witness to the truth faithfully. He never compromised. He's faithful and true witness. He bore witness to uh, the uh, the truth, the, the word he was called to preach. Now, this last part of verse 14 can cause a lot of trouble. It says, he, Jesus says about himself, he is the beginning of the creation of God. So it can cause a lot of trouble because people can use this and, I, and some uh, cults, uh, evidently, I mean, uh, like for example, the um, Jehovah's Witness and, uh, and others who believe, who don't believe in the deity of Christ in the sense of him being equal with God, but who talk about Jesus as a created being, would use this latter part of this verse. Because it's, Jesus says he is the beginning of the creation of God. So they say, oh, he's the first one whom God created. So he's not God, but he's the first one whom God created. He's, you know, as I say, he's a created being. But that is not an interpretation that is consistent with the rest of the scripture. So remember, one of the principles of hermeneutics that we learned is, every passage in scripture has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. You can't just say, it in, say things in isolation. The other, you know, other passages of scripture refer to Jesus Christ as God, who is eternal, uh, who was there from everlasting to everlasting. And, uh, and, and he was, you know, he's the word. The word was with God. He was in the beginning with God and so on. So don't let this phrase the, or the sentence, the beginning of the creation of God put you off in the sense throw you off. I mean, it cannot be interpreted as he's the first one whom God created. 
but it has to be understood as he is the starting point of all of creation. That means all creation took place through him, by him, and for him. I mean, this is where it started, or this is the one through whom it started. It has to be understood like that. It means in him, through him, and by him, all creation began. And this is very consistent with what other scriptures say. Uh, one, one passage that I would point to is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, uh, 16 and 17, For by him all things were created. By him all things were created. Uh, uh, all things were created through him and for him. Right. So I'm talking about Colossians. 1 and verse 16 and 17. So that's the way we understand this, right? So don't let somebody take this this, this line, the sentence and say, oh, look, he was created. No, you have to understand that that's it, everything, all of creation began in him. And that's consistent with Colossians 1, 16 and 17. It's consistent with John chapter 1, verses 1, 2 and 3, right? All things were created by him and for him. Um, and several other scriptures, including, you know, Hebrews 1, 3, you know, again, it says, he, everything began in Christ. So Jesus introduced himself, look, everything starts with me. The beginning of the creation of God, all of creation started there with Jesus. He, it came out of him. And so he speaks to the church at Laodicea and and he says in verse 15, see, I know your works. That means you are doing ministry as a church. I know your works, but it's lukewarm. It's lukewarm, meaning it's half-hearted. You're doing something, but your heart's not in it. It's not passionate work. It's not wholehearted work. You're lukewarm. And I, I, I'd rather that you be on, you know, hot or cold. But you're like, you're doing this. You're doing works, but it's half-hearted. Heart's not in it. Now, why is that? Why is it that they're not, you know, full on fire? Because he says, uh, you know, and so verse 16, he says, because you're lukewarm, I'll get you out, meaning I will just, I'll spew you out. I, mean, I don't like that. It's utter disgust to God. So that's very important that when we serve the Lord, do the works he's called us to do, do it with all our heart. Don't do it half-heartedly. Don't do it with a lukewarm passion. Do it with red-hot, fiery passion. I Meaning 100%. Heart is in it. Because he just doesn't like what's lukewarm. He will just reject it, spew out of the mouth. But why is that? Why were they like that? Well, one because one reason, and one thing that we can see here is, and Jesus points that out in verse 17, he says, you say, I am rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need anything. That means this church in Laodicea had come to a place where they said, look, you know, everything is fine for us. You know, we've got everything. And um, it could be, uh, you know, and if you read some commentaries, they might point this out that it could be that because here they were in a city where everything was going good. And they were in a city where, you know, uh, the city was doing well. So the church was doing well financially. Uh, church, you know, everything was going fine. Uh, no problems. Uh, and so even the church had come to this place of complacency, self-sufficiency. You know, we have everything. Everything is fine. So we don't need anything. And so they became, you know, Okay, we just do our work a little bit, half-hearted, just keep going. They're not on fire, no passion. And they are in this mode where they're saying, 
I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need anything. Now, that maybe their experience in the natural put them like this in the spiritual. Spiritual also, they became complacent. I'm not saying that just because things are going good in the natural, uh, that would make us become complacent. It doesn't have to. You know, We can always keep ourselves stirred up in the spirit uh, with everything going well in the natural too. I mean, and that's great if we can maintain that. But spiritually, this started coming to a place where they said, we don't need anything. But the Lord is telling them, see, actually, spiritually, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Spiritually, that is your condition, your real condition. Poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. Spiritually, bad shape. But you're thinking, oh, I've got everything, everything is fine. Spiritually, you're in bad shape. So, what, what's the solution? Of course, he tells them you have to repent. You have to repent. He says, see, I love you. That's why I'm, rebu I'm rebuking you. That's uh, verse 19. I love you, so I'm rebuking you. I'm correcting you. You need to repent. You need to be zealous or become zealous. You need to stir up that zeal. So what was their problem? They were lukewarm, no zeal, no fire. So what is it? You be zealous, you become zealous, stir up, stir up the fire. And he tells them something very interesting. Verse 18, I counsel you, meaning this is what I'm telling you, how to you know, come out of this situation. Buy from me. Now, what does it mean, buy from me? How do you pay God money to buy from him? What it means is you pay the price. So he's not asking for money, meaning offering or cash. That's not what he's asking. He's saying you pay the price. Spiritually, you pay the price. For what? He says you buy from me gold. You buy from me white garments and you buy from me the anointing that will give you real revelation that you can put on your eyes, you can see. So you buy from me gold. Gold represents what is truly divine, gold. So when you see God, when you see his throne, you, you, know, you see gold. Gold represents what is truly divine, what comes truly from God, gold. You buy from me gold. You buy from me white garments, I mean, this is, true righteousness and you buy from me the anointing to put on your eyes you buy from me the true anointing buy doesn't mean we're giving money but when she says you pay the price spiritually you pay the price to receive what comes truly from God as opposed to you know, just these earthly things, you've got, you're doing very well financially, etc. Now, that is okay. That takes care of the natural things. But spiritually, you need to buy from God what truly comes from God. Second, you pay the price for true righteousness. And you pay the price for true anointing. You pay the price spiritually. So become zealous, stir yourself up. And you pay the price for what really comes from God, for righteousness that comes, true righteousness, that you can walk in true righteousness, and you receive anointing that brings revelation. You pay the price for it. So don't be in this complacent place where you say, everything is fine, I am rich, I am I'm wealthy, I don't need anything. Don't be like that. Because actually, spiritually, you're blind, you're naked. You, you know, spiritually, nothing is there. So become zealous, stir yourself up, and pay the price for this. And he says, he's rebuking them. He says, look, I'm telling you this in love. Because I love you, I'm telling you this. And then verse 20, Revelation 3.20, is a verse that, you know, we all know. 
But it's also a very interesting verse because he's actually speaking it to believers. Uh, we often use that verse when we are doing an altar call or salvation to the unsaved. We say, you know, the Lord is standing at your door and knocking. And if you let him in, he will come inside. Okay. But actually, Revelation 3.20, he's speaking to believers, to the believers here in the church in Laodicea. So what's it telling us? It's telling us that because of this complacency, these believers have actually locked Jesus out of their lives. In other words, they're happy, they're self-sufficient. So they are like, I really don't need Jesus now. He's outside. And he says, I'm knocking. To whom? He's talking to the believers. And if anyone will open the door, I'll come in and I will have this fellowship with him. So Jesus is missing that fellowship. These believers have become complacent. They say everything is fine. So that means they're not having fellowship with Jesus in their personal lives. So he's outside. Yeah, no. So this is just a picture. Uh, Revelation 3.20 is a picture of their current relationship. It's like he's outside. No fellowship with Jesus anymore. They become complacent. Everything is easy. So he's saying, look, I, I long for fellowship. I want to come and I want to fellowship. So I'm knocking. If you let me in, I'm going to come. I'll fellowship with you. So Revelation 3.20 if you look at it from its context, he's actually speaking to the believer. And it shows uh, how deeply the Lord wants fellowship. You know, why else would he be standing and knocking? I stand at the door and knock. Because he wants it. He who desires to fellowship. He says, if you, if you open, if you let me in, you know, I'll come and have a meal. I will sit down and eat with you, meaning this is a picture of that fellowship of communion with the people. What a beautiful picture. But that's the danger of uh, becoming complacent, lukewarm, no zeal, just going on. But he says you need to become zealous. You need to stir yourself up and you need to pay the price and open the door. That's fellowship. That's how we come out of complacency. And then he promises, you know, verse 21, to the overcomer, you're going to sit with me on my throne. You're going to rule with me. So it's not like everything is over. You do this and you're going to sit and reign with me. This is real authority that you're going to have. This is verse 21. So, Even though chapters two and three were written, you know, 2000 years ago almost, and was written to churches in those days, there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot we can take from these seven churches. And we can constantly pray for ourselves as leaders and for our churches and say, oh God, uh, keep us from making, you know, getting into those problems that they got themselves into, keep us from that, help us to walk strong the way you want us to walk uh, and uh, avoid the mistakes. Okay, so it's a time for our break. So we're going to go for a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, we get into chapter four and five, which is we are now moving into things to come things that are up ahead, right? So we will move into that. So let's take a break now and we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 